Hello everyone, this is Angela with Propellicure for Crohn's Disease. Propellicure is proud to bring you yet another video interview with a leading Crohn's disease researcher. In the following interview, we'll be talking to Dr. Bram Verstocht. Dr. Verstocht is a clinician and researcher at the University Hospitals in Leuven, Belgium. He's also a reviewer for many prominent international medical publications. The focus of Dr. Verstock's research is to better understand and to predict the onset and course of inflammatory bowel disease. In his approach to personalized medicine for IBD patients, Dr. Verstock focuses on monitoring tools and the analysis of real life IBD data. We hope you learn as much from our interview with Dr. Verstock as we did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Verstock, for being here. Uh, like I said a, a moment ago before we hit record, I, you are somebody I've been just incredibly excited to talk to for a very long time because, you know, I, I feel like there, there's a lot of great research going on in IBD, but I'm always looking for the people that I think are thinkers and are asking the deep questions and are trying to connect dots to really understand IBD, to understand Crohn's disease, what causes it, the mechanisms. And you just seem to me to be really one of those people, even though you're relatively early in your career, which I think is amazing. I'm also really impressed that I feel like you are working on everything. Uh, you are studying so many things. Uh, you're publishing a lot. But I guess before we get into the substance of all of those interesting things I want to cover with you, could you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and what made you interested to get into studying IBDs? Sure. So um, first of all, thanks also, Eliko, for, for the very kind introduction, also for the invitation joining you tonight. I think it, it's a great uh, initiative, so I'm really glad to be part of it. So indeed, I'm, I'm Bram Verstok, as, as Annabelle already said. Um, I'm indeed Dutch speaking originally, but not living in the Netherlands. So I'm living in, in Belgium, um, in Leuven. Sorry. And I started, I, I started doing IBD years ago. Um, and, and at the time, Paul Rutgers was still leading the unit in Leuven. So he was the first one um, who I got in touch with years ago uh, when I was still at medical school. And already at that moment, um, I was really inspired by the complexity um, and the chronicity of the disease. Um, so I started um, my medical training and I realized in the first months already that I, I really wanted to dedicate the rest of my uh, further professional career in, into gastroenterology and more specifically in inflammatory bowel disease. So it was, I would say, just a, a natural thing which happened over the years. Um, where I felt that on top of my, my clinical um, activities, of course, I also wanted or tried to, to want to make a difference for patients, not only in the clinical field, but uh, also from the scientific field, where I hope many people um, can, can contribute as well to make little steps uh, going forward to, to ultimately improve care for patients and, and quality of life. So um, back in 2015, um, I, I started my PhD in, in Leuven, um, spent the first year of my PhD in, in the UK in Cambridge, and then completed my PhD in 2019. Um, I then had obviously had to finalize my, my residency in gastro, uh, which I did last year. So and now I'm, I'm in the first year of my staff membership in, in Leuven together with Severin Vermeer, with Mark Ferranti and, and with Jar Sabino. So I'm, I'm really fortunate to be there, to, to work in a really inspiring um, team uh, with a lot of fantastic colleagues, both from the GI perspective as from the surgical perspective. But, but I, I would say also the multidisciplinary team, which is around us and which is is increasingly becoming important for the care we try to, to, do, to give to our patients on a daily basis. 
And on top of, of the clinical team, we also have a lot of great um, people in, in our labs, PhD students, postdocs, technicians, um, and our trial team. So we are a very large, a very uh, heterogeneous group. And, and all together, we try to, to give the best we can to, to improve the care for our patients on a daily basis. Yeah, and you mentioned where you're located in Leuven, although I can't pronounce it as well as, as you can in Belgium, but you're part of a really uh, phenomenal you know, team, as you said, a, a great center there that puts out a, a lot of great research um, and really a disproportionate amount of research, I would say, in quality research relative to I, I guess what we would think of as Belgium being a smaller country, what do you think makes your center so productive and so thoughtful and so highly esteemed in terms of a lot of the research that you and others there are putting out? Mm, um, well, I think it, it all started years and years ago with Paul Rutgers, who was really a, a visionary man who founded the unit and then who, who built a unit around him with a lot of people um, in the clinic, but also in the lab. And year by year, step by step, people ha have been um, helping him there, expanding uh, the team. And now Severine has taken over years ago. I think she has the same visionary spirit as he had. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the strengths that, that we can... Um, bring together a lot of people and, and that we can do it all together because of course uh, all the research we do is not just um, one of us it's also not just uh, us as PIs but it's of course a lot of people around us especially all our PhD students and postdocs who are, who are doing an, a great amount and, and a lot of the work uh, which we then can can disseminate with all people in the world. Yes the the visionary aspect is something we definitely um, like and and would reinforce here. We we like to think and hope that you know really everybody who is researching a complex disease like Crohn's disease has to have some vision for the future. I think that's just so important. So let's let's jump into some of the substance. Um, so you wrote a paper last year with uh, another physician I greatly admire, Dr. Silverberg, um, in Toronto. You, you both wrote a paper about disease classification. And we at Propellicure focus on Crohn's disease, so we're really focused on that. But I want you to talk for a minute about what does it matter? If so, why does it matter? And how can we begin to improve our classification of whether it's IBDs or, or even Crohn's specifically? Um, why, do, why does that make a difference in, in terms of our understanding of the underlying diseases? Well, I think still for me, that's one of the most important things because for years and years, of course, Crohn's has, has been... Um, described for the, for the first time years ago, but I think we feel all working in the clinic, patients also experience that, that every story is different. Um, and of course, people have tried to classify um, large group of patients into specific subclassifications. But I think on a daily basis, we, we feel that that clinical classification system is not sufficient. And of course, it's not the aim to have a classification system just for having one and describe it in studies. It's of course because you want to advance the field. If you want to test novel therapies, you want to do it in very specific types of patients because I truly believe that um, there is not just a single Crohn's disease, right? There are many various subtypes and although potentially the phenotype to some extent in some patients might be the same and patients might experience the same um, way their, their disease is affecting their bowel or that the disease itself is behaving in a similar way, this does not necessarily mean that the mechanism behind it molecularly is exactly the same. So for, for me, instead of just 
considering Crohn's disease as an entity, I would say this is a spectrum with a lot of varieties in there, which has um, a molecular background, which is different. And presumably there are classes of, 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 of people who share a common molecular background. And I think if we really would, if, if we really want to advance the field in the next years, in the next decade, I think we need to, to characterize that much more in larger detail so we can run trials starting off from that molecular biology instead of considering, for instance, all patients with colonic disease or it's simply um, ileal disease. F for me, it's much more complex. And of course, if, if, if we define it this way, this will especially in the beginning, this will presumably even increase the complexity. But I, I strongly believe that IBD is really a complex entity. And that's why we need to embrace and try to unravel it as much as possible from all these various angles so we can nail it down to, to what is driving molecularly um, an, an underlying disease in a given individual. So, so here's a, a question, and by the way, some of these questions may not have an answer to that, so it's perfectly okay to say we don't know. But in terms of trying to understand the molecular, uh, you know, underlying mole molecular nature of the diseases, is that going to get us the answer? And, and the reason I ask that is because if you took any complex chronic disease and you just looked at you know, you do a lot of work in omics, right? Different omics for our listeners. You look at the genome and the microbiome and the transcriptome, all these, the metabolome, all these om omics. Is that really going to ultimately explain the underlying cause of disease? Or is that always going to be a downstream view of what's going on? That's an excellent question, and I think we indeed have to make that the difference between what is cause and what is consequence. So I think ultimately, with, with all the novel bioinformatic approaches we have, I think we could come much closer to the cause if you can map and characterize and you strongly see a, a signal popping up on different omic layers in a given individual, you could hypothesize more, much more clearly, I think, what might be a potential driver and a potential cause and then zoom into that. And then obviously you will need a lot of additional experiments to prove that. Um, but it's a start you need to map first. Um, and then once you have much more detail on what are the consequences, then you can absolutely also look um, for, for, the, for the initial causes. And I truly hope that at some point we, we will be able to find a cause, but it, it's definitely something which is highly complex and um, we, should, we should recognize it. But I think the past two years have truly shown and, uh, and, and you've, been, um, you've been saying this out loud correctly, I think many various times on, on, on social media, so the scientific community has shown that we can do a lot all together. Um, if we push it. And, and I think that's maybe one of the only um, positive signals which came out of the pandemic that, that we can do a lot all together. And we've done it for COVID. Of course, there are still a lot of open questions, but I think the whole vaccine story is a beautiful story. If we can, if we join forces that we can, that we can um, do great things in a very short period of time. And of course, we cannot simply compare um, a COVID infection, which is a single pathogen with a complex disease as inflammatory bowel disease, but it, it just to make clear that we need to join forces. And I have the feeling more and more that, that there is a, a driving spirit across countries, across the world, basically, that a lot of people are more and more convinced that this is the way forward also going beyond academia and join forces industry and academia together because of course for all these type of research questions we need money um, and that's the way forward yes so i i agree with what you've said obviously and we are big fans of collaboration um, and collaboration especially between 
different stakeholders, as you've said, industry and uh, academia, but also patients, I think. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and, and, and others, other stakeholders as well, regulatory agencies. I mean, there are a lot of relevant stakeholders in this. I guess uh, taking one step back at the collaboration question, how do you think collaboration is working in the IBD space? Because candidly, I hear different things. You know, some people feel it's going very well. Some people think there's room for improvement. And, and I guess the question would be, how can we generate the same kind of collaborative spirit and sense of urgency that we saw with something like the COVID pandemic? And I know that's I'm really, asking you all the tough questions. So. <laughs> hey, I wanted to say that's really a tough question. I think to answer the first part of your question, uh, I think for, it's of course it it can always be better, right? So there there is always room for improvement for sure. Um, but I the feeling I have in the last years that more and more people are really convinced. We see a lot of consortia arising in Europe, but also transatlantic. Um, from 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 various stakeholders indeed i know that there are some consortia collaborating between academia between industry where also patients are in getting involved where stakeholders other stakeholders like um, payers are being involved because that's obviously a different question and and that also really depends on on how the healthcare system is being organized in in an individual country but I, I feel that people are realizing more and more that, that this is the way forward. And, and looking back at the past 20 years before I entered the field, I think potentially the IBD Genetics Consortium has proven that it's feasible across the, the globe to work together. And I think they have generated some very novel data. They have generated a lot of, of potential um, insights in disease pathogenesis so it they have proven that it can work um, but now it has to it has to go on and we have to push it forward also on from from various other angles to 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 um, achieve that that ultimate goal I would say yes so let me switch gears for a moment um, we know there's a therapeutic ceiling I know you've written about it and talked about it and many of us talk about it uh, what do you think that tells us about IBD? Well, I think it tells us mainly not just simply about IBD, but maybe more about how we treat IBD. Um, I think all the therapies we currently have available are all fantastic molecules but as you said, we are not able to exceed a therapeutic ceiling and to break it. So this means that um, we need novel strategies, not only um, looking or, or approaching disease from an anti-inflammatory perspective, but I think we also have to consider alternative methods, trying to basically um, improve uh, patient symptoms and ultimately improve um, mucosal healing and all these important endpoints um, so for me um and 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 i i'm sure that we can we can go into this deeper i i know and you you've raised relevant concerns about strategies and combination therapies um, but for me combination therapies goes beyond simply combining biological agents I think that there are also other complementary alternative methods. And in some patients, indeed, if you have a molecular reason to combine two biologics, that's absolutely fine. But I think if we consider combination therapy, we should also think outside the box. And it might be that nutritional interventions might come in there, trying to increase further that, that therapeutic efficacy. So, and th there are various other alternatives there which are absolutely valid. And, and that's one for me, one of the ways forward in, in, in the next years. And I agree with you. So the combination therapy that gets talked about a lot, of course, is combining biologics. And I think my only issue is doing that without understanding the underlying mechanisms and just throwing it up against the dartboard and hoping that you get lucky. To me, that is not a strategy, that's, that's a hope. 
You know, that's not a scientific strategy. But I agree with you that to me, combination therapy is a much broader concept and takes novel ideas, as you mentioned. I'm a big believer in nutritional therapy as adjunct therapy. I, I think, you know, in our experience, it's been uh, incredibly helpful, but I'm sure there are others. And whether that's someday some microbiome targeted therapy other than nutrition um, or, or some kind of, you know, epithelial barrier repair type of Indeed, strategy. Indeed, that, that's one of the, the mechanisms that I was referring to. If, I think, but again, it, it all has to be proven, right? It, it's still a concept, but I think if you can have something which intervenes with the microbiome, um, if you have a compound which can reinforce that epithelial barrier, if you have an anti-inflammatory agent and all these types of combination therapies might potentially definitely have a place. And, and as you said, I'm, I'm absolutely not against combination therapies because I strongly believe and I've experienced in some patients that it can truly make a difference, but we, we should at least try to generate the scientific um, evidence for that. And again, then we come back to what we addressed earlier. If you are able to unravel molecularly what is driving the disease, then it might be absolutely um, plausible that in some patients it makes sense to, for instance, block the TNF pathway together with the IL-23 pathway, um, but at least you need some robust evidence. And, and for me, that, that's not just for combination therapy. I think the way forward for all therapies is basically if we can map much more what is driving the disease in a given individual, then you have much more scientific rationale to, to target a, a specific pathway in a given individual. And that will probably help a lot in, in improving the therapeutic efficacy and breaking the ceiling. That makes sense. And maybe I think about this in a much more simplistic way than you know the, the GIs and, and researchers out there. But I always think there has to be some antigen, some some causal something, and that in some ways, the, a lot of the therapies we use today are, are sort of band-aids on that. They suppress the immune system from responding to whatever that antigen is. And so ideally, in my very simplistic assessment of IBD, ideally you discover what that antigen is and remove or, or in some other way deal with that antigen. Is that... D does that have any, you know, does that resonate with you in any way or it and be honest, please, I, I can take it. Is I, that simplistic? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think it's a relevant question, but I don't think we have, we have the final answer there to be, to be very honest. I think it, it, of course, it, if, if that would be the case, that would be great because then we, we can cure quickly I, I would say if you have if you know what you need to target then you can then you can rule it out I'm still not convinced that a single antigen can explain such a variety on, on of different clinical and molecular phenotypes so then the question is is the complexity explained by the various environmental factors is it explained by the, the differences in genetic backgrounds and hence the reaction towards the same antigen. I, I'm not convinced, but it doesn't mean it's not the case. I think many people have, have investigated that. Um, there are some data there, but I think we, we still have, we don't have the final answer there. There has been some suggestions on a specific strain of I. coli. Uh, Jean-Fred Colombel has done a lot of pivotal work on that. There are data from France, um, more towards the, the the microbacteria, um, but again, we don't have the final answer yet. And if it would be the case, um, it, it, it would definitely help in our aim to cure the disease. Um, but I think if you, and of course I realize that this is a surrogate, but if you look at all the serological analyses which have been done over the year, it's not that there is just a single um, serology popping up there as, as, as a potential suggestion for, for, for a, a driver or a cause of the disease, unfortunately. 
Yeah, or we just don't know yet. We don't know what we're looking for. Yeah, that's so it's true. Hard, it's hard to know. And, and you're right, you know, the data that's out there today, it, it not, nothing is present in 100% of Crohn's patients. It's always no. some subset of some. So, I mean, there may be multiple antigens. Um, you, know, it, you know, it can be, again, as you said earlier, potentially even different diseases <clears throat> with a similar presentation. Um, yeah. But anyway, that antigen question is just always sort of at the back of my mind. So I, I, I thought I'd ask it. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, because you've done a lot of really great work on is biomarkers and biomarkers in, in kind of looking at two different things. One is um, predicting the development of IBD and, uh, and, and there's some great research out there about potential predictors of IBD. Um, you know, the GEM study is, is one that I really like, but there are, there are others as well. And then also prognostic biomarkers, like how can we answer this question everybody wants to answer? Who's gonna develop complicated or severe disease? Who's gonna have a milder disease course? We still don't know. And you've done great work on biomarkers. I've joked before on social media about, you know, the title of the paper is here's another biomarker no one will ever use. Um, that's not your paper, but I, I, I say that sarcastically because I feel like there are good, there is good research like yours pointing to uh, the clinical utility of biomarkers, but their use in practice um, hasn't, been taken up yet. So mm -hmm. why do you think that is? And what can we do? And I'm thinking of work you've done on TREM1 and Oncostatin M, for example, which can predict response to anti-TNF therapies, potentially. My layperson read is there's pretty good data there. You know, what can we do? And, and then other studies you've done as well. What can we do um, in general to get biomarkers into the clinic? Mm -hmm. Again, a very relevant question. We, we're asking ourselves this question on a daily basis of how can we bring it to our patients because that's ultimately the goal. It's not the goal to publish the papers. The goal is to, to make the change in the clinic, right? The, the, the big concern there, and then I'm not speaking as a scientist, but speaking as a physician, is obviously the moment you want to bring it to your patients, you want to be highly convinced um, that it's a valuable that it's a valuable tool, and you don't want to bring something to the clinic where there still are some concerns, right? And and with many of these markers, including Trem One, including Oncostatin, these have been identified, these have been replicated, but there are also conflicting data out there, and this makes it difficult. And at some stage you need to make a decision and you just have to jump and start a trial, right? Um, so for instance, for TREM1, that's, that's something we were about to launch, but then we did, we, we wanted to have one large additional study to have like the final answer and to make sure before we bring it to the clinic, let's validate it in a large randomized trial. And that's what we did. I've presented these data now at ECHO recently, and unfortunately, the signal is entirely flat. And then the, the question comes again, is this because of the different populations you're looking at, because a real life population is different from a trial population? Um, if that's the case, and you still believe in the marker, what should be your endpoint? So, so these are all different. These are challenging questions. And, and I think if, if we look at it from a prognostic point of view, I think that the profile trial, which is running now in the UK and which is, is completely full. So we, have, we will have the results like next year. If that trial is positive, I think this will be a landmark trial, right? Because this would be the first trial confirmed by prognostic biomarker in, in the field. So if, if that trial turns out to be positive, I think the uptake of the marker will be extreme. But, but again, we need to, first of all, await the results there from the trial and also how it then is translated in, in daily clinical practice. But, but I fully get your point and I fully support that, that 
um, that there is a huge discrepancy be between what is in literature already being reported and what is translated to the patients. And, and that again, to me, that comes back to the complexity of IBD, which is entirely different from oncology, where in oncology, you have these very robust markers, um, which everyone agrees upon, which have been replicated so many times, and where you, you clearly know that a molecular phenotype from a tumor is linked to the success of a potential therapy, or at least to some extent. And that's absolutely the way forward. Um, and, and, and this, to me, again, comes back to what we discussed originally, that we need to invest on, on that mapping. And I'm not saying that we should map all patients in the future for all these various omics, but at least we should tease out what are the relevant ones so we can then have like very easy to implement tools to use them in daily clinical practice. Um, and, and to me, th there is also an important responsibility, I think, for, for, for uh, the regulators. Um, I think at some point, especially with, with the number of treatments um, going, coming onto the market, at some point they should at least uh, make it compulsory to have a bio de biomarker development pipeline as part of the, of the trial design, which is luckily more and more companies are building this in on a voluntary basis. But I think to at a, at a certain point, FDA and EMA should make that truly compulsory that at least there is some data being generated. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be together with the drug at a time of approval, but at, at least that there is a plan and that there is an incentive to do so. I completely agree with you. And I would definitely, uh, I think from a patient, a parent perspective, we would love to see the regulators um, require that because although some may do it voluntarily, clearly many companies will not invest unless it's required. So that that would be uh, absolutely helpful because again, we're sort of in our perspective, we're in this situation of the Russian roulette of therapies. You know, you you try one, you hope it works. It's often whatever the payer will pay for is the one you try. Uh, if it doesn't work, you try another one mm -hmm. and so on. And again, to me, that's not a strategy. So I'm, I'm hoping that with more therapies now and more thought about biomarkers and the research that you're doing and a lot of the profiling that we will get more, um, I don't want to say precision medicine because it is a buzzword, uh, but, yeah. but targeted, you know, targeted uh, therapies for, for individuals. So maybe we'll segue into, into that uh, precision medicine a little bit um, because again, you have done work in this space and, and it goes back to the profiling, the molecular profiling you're talking about. But what do you see, like, what are you most excited about that at least moves us, even if slowly into the direction of being able to identify for this individual, you know, this is the mechanism, this is the drug that may work? I think if, if we look back at, at what is available in literature, what is the most convincing to me or what has been replicated the most uh, with the least conflicting data, it's mainly the mucosal biomarkers. So I, I know we all aim, and I also aim to have like these non-invasive markers um, by, by, by blood samples, because of course that's for patients the most convenient. But there is so much more, at this stage at least, there is so much more noise and, and bias in these blood markers because it's affected by so many more things um, whereas if you look at all the papers out there on, on, the, the, on the tissue transcriptomics, these seems to me much more uh, convincing and much more robust. Uh, so I think if, if, we, if on, on, the, on the short period of time we have to move the needle, then it will be for me at this stage with the data which are there, it will be the tissue. And what, what is it that your... Um... Like what, if you can talk about it, what's your next area of focus or what's a question that you ideally would really like to answer? There are so many. Yes, <laughs> me <honesty>. too. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, I think in, in our lab, and that's not just my work, of course, that's the work of many people. Um, we try on, on various research lines, we, we try, I think, to, to improve many of the things we've been discussing here. I have um, some of my colleagues who is colleagues who is working much more in, in, in what we discussed on the combination therapy with nutrition. That's one part. Um, I have another colleague of mine who is working much more on, on quality indicators and, and all the prompts and the prems which are as important for patients. Um, when it comes to my interests or my key focuses at the moment, it's indeed really trying to unravel uh, that heterogeneity so we can rethink the classification again, not just descriptively, but mainly to point toward targets. And then we come back to the point you, you referred to before that um, if we could go um, much more targeted, that presumably might could make a much uh, stronger benefit and, is, and a stronger difference for many patients. Yes, and then you can do it earlier too, right? Because you know what you're yeah. looking for. In, in an indeed. early indicator and you can sort of nip it in the Absolutely. bud before. Yeah, and, and instead of what, what you indeed mentioned, the Russian roulette, where you indeed just cycle from one drug to another until you ultimately find hopefully one which works. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, what... I guess, what, what would you want our community to know about you and your work and your research? Um, you know, what can patients do to help? What is it that, you know, you wish that the patient and caregiver community uh, knew or could do to help expedite a lot of the, the research to get us to a better understanding of, of Crohn's? Well, first of all, it's, it's absolutely not about me, right? It's about pushing the, the field forward and, and, and move that needle for patients. But I think what we have to do, and, and we've, we've touched upon this before, I think we really have to join forces. Um, we have to convince more people, especially uh, not, not the stakeholders who already know about it, right? So patients are, are, are convinced about this. Um, scientists are about, uh, convinced about this, clinicians, but I think the other ones, right? Um, I feel that in more and more uh, companies, this is also more and more being part of their, of their pipelines, which I, I truly appreciate and highly value, but I, it goes further. As we said before, it's also about the payers, it's about the regulators, and there I think a lot of change still has to Im Im be implemented. On top, as we were speaking about joining forces, I think, of course, um, the more we can do that all together, just to speed up the process to, to um, achieve the funds which are needed for these, these, these important questions, the, the quicker we can, we can advance and, and make that important difference for patients. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe I'll open it up now. I've asked you too many questions already. Natalie, do you have any questions for Dr. Verstock? Thanks, Ildiko. Great questions. And thank you again, Dr. Verstock, for taking the time to do this. Um, I have two questions. My first question I have is about the predictive biomarkers. What is your vision for how those predictive biomarkers will be used and what intervention strategies um, do you see being employed if we discover that someone has these predictive biomarkers? What does intervention look like at that very early stage? Um, so to come back to your first question, if I understood correctly, so this means that um, so to, to have these predictive biomarkers, can you repeat? Because I, I do not entirely recall um, what you mentioned. So uh, I've read that um, in recent research that we have biomarkers that indicate that a, an individual will go on to develop IBD, mm -hmm. go on to develop Crohn's disease. How do you see those types of biomarkers being utilized and is it more or less to say that this person has these biomarkers 
or is that an opportunity to intervene? And what does that intervention look like? Yeah, I think that's 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 an, an absolutely a highly relevant question. It, it's not the field I've been working in the most. I think Joana Torres and, and Jean-Fred Colombella have been the key leaders in there in, in recent years. Um, it's always a very delicate balance, right? Um, if, if, if there are very robust signals and if you can predict with very high accuracy that um, someone will develop a Crohn's disease phenotype or a UC phenotype, then I think if we are able to prevent that, that's absolutely the, 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 the ultimate goal. However, then the question comes, how are you going to prevent this? And, and what are the potential harms and what are the potential gains? And if, if you can prevent that with an, an environmental or nutritional um, inter, in, 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 um, intervention, I think this is something which can be justified to, to a person. If you, of course, at that stage already are considering biological agents or any other therapies, which also have their potential side effects, that will be something much more difficult, in my view, to to convince people to do so. Of course, if you have a marker with a 100% certainty that someone will develop it, and if you have a therapy which can 100% prevent that, then of course that's a different discussion, but nothing in medicine, nothing in life is black or white. So it's always a bit gray. So it, it's a very delicate balance. And I think a lot will depend on how accurate can we predict and how accurate can we interfere. But, but that's, I think, a lot of people are working on this because this is one of the ways forward and potentially, but this is hypothetically, if you're able to pick up the signals very early, the type of interventions might be, might be potentially much more subtle than they would be if a patient or a person develops a very severe phenotype, right? Then you probably hit too hard, hit, have too hard, uh, have to hit hard much stronger than, than you would have to do so if you can intervene in the very subtle beginning. But that's purely hypothetical, I would say. Um, Great, thank you. And my second question is, we always, we go into fields and we have an idea of what we know. What would you say, just in your experience, what the most interesting thing that you've learned in your IBD research so far? from a personal standpoint? That's a really good question. And that's a, that's a tough one, honestly. <laughs> it's okay, you, I, you, I you can come back with the answer at a later date in, if you need to think about in, it. I, th I think the most important I've experienced is, although we think we know more, we actually don't know a lot about inflammatory bowel disease. So there, there has, a lot of fantastic and brilliant research uh, being ongoing for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But still, there is so much we don't know. And if we truly want to make a difference in the next 10, 20 years for patients, and the sooner the better, obviously, then there are so much burning questions which have to be tackled. And, and that comes back to one, I think, of the ultimate questions Ildiko was referring to before, what is basically the cause of the disease? After all these years, we still don't know, unfortunately. And if you don't know what's causing or driving it, then it's very difficult to cure it, right? Um, so for me, that's still, it's, it's, it's from a clinical and from a, a scientific perspective, it's, it's a fascinating field. And I truly love to look, for, to look after my patients, but some of them, have such a challenging and complicating life it's it's such a devastating disorder that it's such a pity that even after all these years and so much great research by so many people that there is still so much of an unanswered questions and and that's not only the case for ibd unfortunately that's that's so for so that's the case for so many disease areas thank you dr verstock Annabelle, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Actually, um, I think uh, Natalie kind of covered the ones that I was thinking of. Um, I did want to ask you, like, because you're talking about the spectrum, basically, of Crohn's. It can be, it's, you know, it could be individual diseases or it could be a spectrum. 
Um, would you put you UC in there, ulcerative colitis? Could that be a spectrum of Crohn's? Well, to, to me, I, I think they're all on a spectrum, right, of inflammatory entities, of inflammatory disorders. Um, and if we, if we look at the spectrum of inflammatory bowel disease, for me, this is indeed a continuum. And, and I think all of, of, of the physicians looking after patients with inflammatory bowel disease, we all have some patients in who we don't know exactly whether it's Crohn's or it's UC. And, and I think we have some evidence, not a lot, but I think there is some genetic evidence and also some other evidence that it's indeed a spectrum. But for me, and that's not covered in the paper um, uh, Ildiko was referring to, but for me, I think the spectrum is even going beyond inflammatory bowel disease. It's a spectrum of immune-mediated uh, inflammatory disorders where psoriasis, where a lot of the rheumatology uh, entities are also part of. And in some individuals, the, the, the predominance of a, of a phenotype is in the bowel. In some others, it's more the skin or it's the joints. And unfortunately, in, in some patients have it all, unfortunately. But to me, the spectrum goes even further than simply inflammatory bowel disease. It's, it's, an, immune, it's an immune state. And if you look at what we know, the little we know about the pathogenesis of all these disorders, it always comes down to the, the, the same key things. And then again, the question comes, why is there a difference in the, in the phenotype people are experiencing? That, that's another very relevant question. Do you have, I mean, I know that you said, we don't know, we don't know, but do you have some sort of like ideas in your own that, hmm, that you think that is causing one particular type of phenotype rather than another? Or are you just completely letting it, letting the- I, I, you and, uh, No, if I would know, I would definitely <laughs> hope we could, it could help to, 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 to improve the care, but unfortunately I don't. Well, that's actually good because I mean, that keeps you, you know, very open-minded because sometimes people, I mean, on one hand, it's good to be bullheaded and say that it's this, they're, you know, for sure it's this particular thing. On the other hand, um, if it's not that, you've spent an awful lot of years, you know, trying to prove that one particular thing. And um, sometimes it's good to be open. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I go back to what I said earlier, Dr. Verstock, that I think you're very thoughtful and I, I like everything that you just said. And it resonates with me, particularly around, you know, at, at, that after decades of a lot of good research and obviously a lot of new therapies, that there still is such a large gap in our knowledge. And I think that's exactly why Propellicure exists. Uh, because we saw that as well. And, and certainly patients and, and parents like myself feel that um, just from a, a treatment, a day-to-day -day treatment and clinical perspective. Um, and so my thinking around this, and I'd like to get your thoughts maybe as we close this out, my thinking around this is that we really need a more um, you know, global, you talked about global and you talked about consortia, we need a more global and thoughtful effort where we really sort of map out the unknowns and the knowns and then start to formulate research questions that take us down a path, a roadmap of sorts to get us to answer some of these questions. Do you think that there's potential within these consortia and within these collaborations globally to try to get to that kind of research roadmap? I, I'm absolutely convinced that's the case. I, I've, of course, as you said, I'm still relatively young and in the beginning of my career, but a lot of the, the, the people who are my mentors and the people who have, have, have trained me and educated me over the years, um, I think there are a lot of visionary people out there who are absolutely convinced that this is the way forward. Um, I, I have, when you ask this question, I have many people in mind that I think would absolutely be in favor of trying to join forces as much as we could to make uh, the next step. And then let's do it. 
Yeah, I think we should make it happen. And I think it's your generation that's going yeah. to make it happen. Well, I think we, we have to, we have, of course, we, we have great people in, in front of us who have trained us and, and now indeed, um, together with them and, and so many others and especially I think these type of initiatives are so important to raise the awareness and, and to, to, um, to stimulate people to, to do it um, and, and that's I think one of the key things uh, that it's, it's not only um, talking about it but I, I think it's as important even more important to, to make it ultimately happen. I think part of what that um from what I have seen a lot of, at least my feeling of, of what's happening sometimes is that you get these really interesting papers that come out and they, people go, oh yeah, that's, that's great. That's really interesting. And then they seem to be filed away and you never hear about it again. And I find that disturbing. Um, do you see any, is, is this something that you've also seen? Is this, or is this something that, uh, I'm just picking up out of, you know, and it doesn't really have any bearing. No, that's, that's true. But I think there is so much fantastic research out there that it's already in one specific area. It's already very difficult to, to be on top of things. And it gets really difficult to, to know everything what's ongoing in, in the field. Um, so for all of us, it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to know what's happening. And, and that's why I think these type of, of consortia can help. Uh, they will not um, resolve all of the problems, but it can help to disseminate knowledge um, because there is so much excellent research ongoing on all, in all parts of the world. Um, but if we could discuss this more intensively, that might definitely help. And if we could disseminate um, to make that ultimate goal um, finally uh, happen. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think that was a, a really, really good and robust discussion. You know, we, we don't expect anyone to have the answers, but just a, a path forward and a sense of urgency and asking, you know, I think um, good intellectual questions. And, and I think you do all of that. So thank you again so much for taking this time today. And I think it's going to be informative to a lot of people. Likewise, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>